Today I want to talk about uh, the devil, uh, because there's many things that are believed about the devil that aren't true. Uh, many myths that have kind of become incorporated with um, the understanding of many believers. Um, and these are things that the world believes about the devil. Um, you tend to find when the world holds beliefs about something that people loosely associate with the with the Bible, um, those beliefs are untrue. Um, and as students of the Word, we would want to know what the Word says about the devil and not uh, popular culture. Uh, so the devil, Hasatan in Hebrew, um, Satan being adversary, the adversary, Hasatan. Um, hopefully I'll be able to equip you with uh, knowledge so that you can uh, defeat the adversary, give you uh, some intelligence from the Bible, if you like. Now, a saying that you may well have heard um, is the greatest trick the devil ever pulled is uh, was convincing the world he did not exist. Um, I don't think that this is true. Um, I think his greatest trick, if you like, um, is convincing people who trust in the Bible that he is something that he's not. It's kind of like um, a distraction technique. If you look over here, you don't see what I'm doing over here sort of thing. So if you think that the devil is something that he's not, um, then you are expecting attacks that perhaps are not the attacks um, that he will make, um, convincing people that he has more authority than he does, for example, is an example of the sort of thing that people have come to believe about the devil. And I don't even like the phrase, phrasing of this because it kind of presumes that the devil is the way that people think that he is. Um, if it's the greatest trick that he ever played, it kind of uh, plays into the idea that he's the one who creates evil and um, all sorts of misunderstandings. Um, a picture that I've put up before that I think encapsulates uh, certain misunderstandings is the idea that the devil is against um, God. That's not the case though. He has no power, certainly not a power equal with God. He's not contending against God. God created the devil in order to be um, a tool. Um, so this picture is inaccurate for multiple reasons. We've got Yeshua with long hair, for example, there. That's another myth um, that the world believes that is not biblically accurate. Um, and the idea that it's a power struggle between the devil, God makes a move, and then the devil makes a move, for example, um, just isn't how we see uh, these things in Scripture. Hasatan, the tempter, it seems to me is necessary in order to get man to go astray. Adam and Eve were in the garden. Um, if there was nothing inducing them to sin, then maybe they never would have sinned. But the propensity to sin, the propensity to be tempted is something that was inside of them. Um, so 
Yehovah used Hasatan in that instance, um, and he tempted Eve, and Adam and Eve fell um, as a result of that. Um, and he works in a similar way in our lives. It is necessary that we are tempted in order that our faith would be proved. The idea of Satan as ruler of the underworld, for example, is um, not biblically accurate either. Um, hell uh, is, a, you know, it's a big subject. I've taught on it before in the Life After Death series. Um, but hell was originally the Norse underworld. And in later Norse mythology, hell became the being, the name of the being that presided over the Norse underworld. So you can see there how uh, the idea of the devil ruling over hell um, came about. Uh, the idea of the underworld being ruled over by a being um, is something that we see in pagan cultures, pagan understandings. Um, so the idea that the devil rules over hell, of course, is not true. The idea that he is a ruler is also not true. It says, it, the Bible makes reference to the God of this age. Um, but that doesn't mean that he is a God. Just means that people make him their God. Um, he is the one that they believe. They don't believe Yehovah's word. When Hasatan comes along with a lie, they believe that instead. But he's not a ruler of anything. He is a created being. And since we know that Yehovah is outside of time, we know that he has created Hasatan for a purpose, knowing all of the things that Hasatan will do and intending all the things that Hasatan will do to come to pass. Um, the worship of Satan is kind of like the worship of a caricature. It's the worship of um, a being that doesn't exist. Um, so one of the greatest misunderstandings about Satan is that he is something that he is not, um, that he has more power, that he does things that he doesn't do, that he's the one who institutes evil, uh, whereas the word says that a man is tempted by what is inside. All the tempter can do is come and show that person something by which that person, by what's inside, might be tempted uh, to go astray after. So you've got the truth of the word, that which is firm, steadfast, reliable, and then you've got the lie, that which might be in enticing um, but that ultimately has no uh, firm footing upon which to proceed, something that you will go after and will become unstable in your following of. In uh, Torah portion Vaychi, uh, recently, I used this image to represent Hasatan and I think it's it's a good image. Um, all we're told, really, by Scripture, is that the devil is a he. Uh, we don't really get any other descriptions of him. People think that Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 give descriptions of the devil. Um, but actually, if you read the passages, they're talking about the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14 and the king of Tyre in Ezekiel 28. People 
think, well, how can the king of Tyre have been in the Garden of Eden, which is what Ezekiel 28 says. Uh, but they're not reckoning the fact that a king or a prince in scripture are very often uh, descriptions of spiritual entities. Um, and it, it's only that which makes people think, well, it can't be talking about a human king, so it must be talking about the devil. We know the devil was in the Garden of Eden. Um, but such uh, reckoning is flawed because it's based on the assumption that the king of Tyre would have to be um, a human king. Uh, but we're not given details to describe Hasatan. Um, he certainly doesn't have the breastplate that is mentioned in Ezekiel 28. Um, to me, he is uh, he's associated, in my mind, with uh, the lying vapors which come up before us and may well tempt us into going after that which is impermanent. Uh, Im, impermanent. <laughs> um, that which doesn't have any substance. So I like this image for that reason. In uh, Jude 1, 9 to 10, it says, In the same way, indeed, these dreamers defile the flesh and reject authority and speak evil of esteemed ones. But uh, Michael, the chief angel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moshe, presumed not to bring against him a blasphemous accusation, but said, Yehovah rebuke you. And there's something important that we can learn from that. People are very uh, quick to speak against the devil. Um, to, um, as it says here, blaspheme the devil. To blaspheme uh, something is to speak against the name of. Um, and even Michael, the archangel, was uh, not prepared to bring a railing accusation against the devil. He recognizes that Yehovah has given him authority, and we should do the same. We don't give any worship to the devil, but if you want to phrase it like that, we give the devil his due. Um, we recognize that Yehovah is ultimately in control, that he is the one who gives all authority, and he has given authority to the devil, and we should uh, be respectful of that. We, sh we shouldn't speak in a slanderous or blasphemous way against uh, the devil. Uh, we should recognize where he is, recognize what he's for, give him um, the respect of his position, but know ultimately that um, he leads the world astray and that that is a bad thing, just like human authorities. We might not like the authorities that Yehovah um, has instituted on the earth. Um, Nebuchadnezzar was, we're explicitly told, was raised up by Yehovah. Um, and the things that Nebuchadnezzar did were just disgraceful. Um, but Yehovah put him in that position. Um, we're told that he will do that with even the basest of men. And we should have respect to their position, even if the things that they do um, are not good in terms of how Yehovah would uh, define good. In Revelation 20, 7 to 8, it says, When the thousand years have ended, Satan shall be released from his prison. 
and he shall go out to lead the nations astray which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for battle, whose number is as uh, the sand of the sea. So we're told there that he uh, will go out and lead the nations astray, not Israel. He will lead the nations astray. And indeed, that's what we see uh, that he does. He leads the nations astray. Obviously, of course, he also um, tempts those who are Israel. But it's interesting that he goes out and he leads the nations astray. So this is after the thousand years. He's been in prison for a, th a thousand years. Then he's released and he goes out uh, to the four corners of the earth and leads the nations astray. But notice, this is saying this is what he is in, intended by Yehovah to do. He is a tool of Yehovah. Um, this isn't a surprise to Yehovah. You know, he, it's not like the counter move of the devil is to go and lead the nations astray. Yehovah knows exactly what is going to happen. Um, and he has told us beforehand that this is going to happen. It is necessary that this happens, in fact. In Revelation 12, 9 to 10, it says, uh, the great dragon was thrown out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who leads all the world astray. He was thrown to the earth, and his angels were thrown out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now have come the deliverance and the power and the kingdom of our Elohim and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers who accused them before Elohim day and night has been thrown down. So he leads the world astray, but to the brethren, to Israel, he is the accuser. We'll see um, a little bit of how he works in the book of Job. But he will come and he will uh, accuse the brethren before the Father. Um, and he has given authority to go and tempt those people. So if he has something which he can say, well, this person will do this if I tempt them in this way. Uh, it seems he brings that to the Father and he has to ask to sift people. Um, we see in the, um, in the book of Job, we'll go in fact to the book of Job, Yehovah said to Satan, from where do you come? And Satan answered Yehovah and said, from diligently searching in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And Yehovah said to Satan, have you, consider, have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth, a perfect and straight man, one who fears Elohim, and turns aside from evil, and this isn't um, this isn't Yehovah saying to him, "Have you considered Job? Maybe you'd like to tempt him." He is saying, basically, "I see that you have considered my servant Job." Um, he's not suggesting it. He is. Um, he's acknowledging. Uh, that he has been considered. And Satan answered Yehovah and said, Is Job fearing Elohim for naught? Have you not made a hedge around him and around his household and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions 
um, have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and strike all he has if he would not curse you to your face. So there's the accusation. Job's only doing this because you've got a hedge of protection around him and around his household. Yehovah said to Satan, See, all that he has is in your hand. Only do not lay a hand on himself. And Satan went out from the presence of Yehovah. But notice, Satan says to Yehovah, Stretch out your hand. Strike all that he has. And Yehovah uh, responds and says, um, he is in your hand. We see in scripture, um, sometimes it will say, Yehovah does a thing, but it is by the hand of another. Like when it says, Yehovah moved David to count uh, the people in the census. And then elsewhere it says that it was Hasatan who did it. So Hasatan said, stretch out your hand and do this. And Yehovah grants him the authority to do the thing that he, he has asked. But he comes before him with an, accusa an accusation against Job that really it's only because he has God's protection um, that he is faithful. And if that is removed from, from him, he'll, he will curse God to his face. And actually, that's what we see Job doing um, as things go badly for Job. Job curses God. He curses the day that he was born and all sorts of other things. In Luke 22, 31 to 32, it says, And the master said, Shimon, Shimon, it's, uh, Simon, Simon, Simon Peter, Satan has asked for you to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your belief should not fail, and when you have turned, strengthen your brothers. So, Hastan has come and asked for Peter uh, in very much the same way that we see him asking for Job in order that he can sift him. Uh, but Yeshua says, I've prayed for you that your belief for your faith will not fail. Um, so when Hastan comes with a temptation, uh, it seems from this that it is possible that um, one's belief or faith will not fail in that situation. Where it says, when you have turned, strengthen your brothers. Um, that may well be a, um, a reference to repentance. Has the time will come and tempt you if you fall, you make repentance and uh, you come back to Elohim. Just like we see with Job when he uh, accuses Yehovah and Yehovah answers, answers him from the whirlwind in Job 38. Afterwards, Job realizes what he has done wrong and he comes in repentance to Yehovah and it seems to be something uh, that Yeshua is alluding to uh, here with Peter. In First Peter 5, 8 to 11, we see um, the idea of the devil going about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, which is very much what um, was said in, uh, in the book of Job. He says, I've been going about to and fro on the earth. Um, and that seems to be what Peter, um, Peter expresses here. Resist him, firm in the belief, knowing that the same hardships are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. 
So again, we've got the the idea that when Hasatan comes up looking to tempt you, you are able to resist him, firm in the belief. And the Elohim of all favor, who called you to his everlasting esteem by Messiah Yeshua, after you've suffered a while, himself perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Okay, and that's obviously very similar to uh, the Lord's Prayer um, as we know it. Um, in Matthew 4, we see the temptation of Yeshua. He was led up by the uh, Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tried by the devil. Um, of course, another part of the Lord's Prayer, we pray, lead us not into temptation. Yeshua here was led into temptation. So it, it is sometimes necessary um, that we would be led into temptation also to be tried by the devil, uh, to be sifted, if you like, to use his words that he spoke to Peter. And after having fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the trier came and said, If you are the son of Elohim, command that these stones uh, become bread. But he answering said, It has been written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yehovah. Then the devil took him uh, up into the set apart city, set him on the edge of the set apart place. And that's interesting. It says that the devil took him, presumably bodily, from place to place. Uh, we don't see that elsewhere in the scriptures, but that's what's described here. Uh, but notice how Yeshua resists uh, the temptation of the devil. When the devil comes and he posits something to him, he responds by quoting the scripture right back at him. Uh, the devil comes and tries to misrepresent the scripture to him, just like uh, people might misrepresent the scriptures today. They might say, look, Paul here says, no flesh is just the justified by the law. Therefore, you don't need to do the law, which is taking what the scripture says that is true. No one is justified by the law and twisting it. Um, and it's important for us to know the word to be able to combat such attacks, which are attacks of the devil to tempt you. We know that the flesh is not subject to the Torah of Elohim. So the flesh is quite willing to um, accept the explanations why uh, the, the Torah of Elohim has no power anymore. Um, so we are uh, predisposed, if you like, to believe those sorts of lies if we are operating in the flesh. If we're operating in the spirit, then the spirit acknowledges that the Torah is good and um, those who walk in the spirit, there is no condemnation to them uh, if they are in Messiah. And that is, of course, doing the word which is inspired by the Spirit, the Spirit and the Word are kind of some synonymous terms. And said to him, If you are the son of Elohim, throw yourself down, for it has been written, He shall command his angels concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, so that you do not dash your foot against a stone. So again, he comes and says, look, if it's true 
that you're the son of Elohim, then the angels will protect you. So throw yourself down um, into their protection. Yeshua said to him, it has also been written, you shall not try Yehovah your Elohim. Um, and we saw what that trying is uh, to do with uh, the smell. That is what is uh, forbidden. But the idea that uh, Yeshua could cast himself off and the angels would have to protect him because that's what the word of God says. Uh, Yeshua says to throw himself off and to presume upon uh, the angels to come and protect him would be to test Yehovah uh, and that that is not correct. The devil might come to us with a temptation and say, well, does the word not say that he will provide for your every need? So, therefore, you can go into this, sec this si situation recklessly because he is going to provide for your every need, uh, even if you're being reckless. Um, and our, our retort would be, it is also written this, so the entire context of all the scriptures is needed. The devil might come with bits of scripture and say, well, the scripture says this. Um, and often it is necessary for us to put that into the correct context of the rest of scripture and say, well, yes, that's written, but it's also written this. Again, the devil took him uh, took him up on a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their esteem and said to him, all these I shall give you if you, if you fall down and worship me. Then Yeshua said uh, to him, go Satan, for it has been written, you shall worship Yehovah your Elohim and him alone you shall serve. Then the devil left him and see, angels came and attended, attended him. Okay, so we see the application of resist the devil and he shall flee. But how do you resist the devil when he comes with his temptations? You do it with scripture. He will come with a lie, something which is uncertain, something which is shaky um, and tempt you to put your weight on that thing. Whereas the word of God is steadfast and reliable. Um, it's a solid foundation for us to take our steps on. So what we do is we say, no, the thing that I believe, the thing that is firm is this. So whatever lie you're coming up with, no matter how convincing it might seem to me, since it's against the truth, I know it to be a lie. And so reciting scripture, finding the scripture, reading the scripture is the way to uh, defeat temptation in one's mind. Matthew 26 41 says, watch and pray, lest you should enter into trial. The spirit indeed is eager, but the flesh is weak. Again, the spirit acknowledges that the, uh, the, that the Torah is good, and that it's just, that it's holy. So the spirit is all for the Torah, but the flesh is weak, and that is what we must conquer, the lusts of the flesh. We must put that to the side and go with what our spirit tells us. That's what we're tested in. Um, do we believe in the word of Elohim as 
something which is firm? Um, do we believe anything that is against it is a lie and is automatically undesirable? Um, but again, we see the admonition to the disciples of watch and pray lest you enter into trial. And I would say that this is a very important thing that we should be praying, that pray that we do not enter into trial um, because our flesh is weak. Um, we actually see Yeshua counsel the disciples when they ask him how should we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Part of it is do not lead us into trial. Again, it was the spirit that led Yeshua into the wilderness to be tried. But deliver us from the wicked one. Sometimes you'll see there, uh, deliver us from evil. Um, but evil is written in Greek, in the genitive singular masculine. Um, so evil one uh, is a translation which um, is not only possible, but makes more sense given the understanding of um, the devil that we have. Um, so deliver us from the evil one, the one who will tempt us, because yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we have there a, uh, an acknowledgement that Yehovah is the one who is ultimately in control. It's his kingdom. It's his power. It's his esteem or his glory. Um, the devil has no power that he created himself, he didn't, um, he didn't bring himself into being. Yehovah is ultimately the one who is sovereign over those events. So then subject yourselves to Elohim, resist the devil and he shall flee from you. Draw near to Elohim and he shall draw near to you. Cleanse hands sinners and cleanse the hearts you double-minded. Exactly what Yeshua modeled for us. He, um, if you want to use this figurative language, he drew near to Elohim. He uh, brought himself in line with all of what the scripture says. Cleanse the hands, cleanse the hearts is just um, a reference to what we would do in um, making repentance and making our, ourselves clean before Elohim and um, following his word. Yeshua, of course, resists the devil and the devil fled from him. In Ephesians 6, 10 to 11, we're told how to... Um, how to have power to stand against the uh, schemes of the devil. It says, For the rest, my brothers, be strong in the master and in the mightiness of his strength. Put on the complete armor of Elohim for you to have power to stand against the schemes of the devil. So, the armor of Elohim, uh, the various components of it are all components or aspects of the word of Elohim. And if we clothe ourselves in that, that gives us power to stand against the schemes of the devil. Um, the word of Elohim is truth, is a met. It is uh, something steadfast, stable, upon which we can stand. Um, and it gives us sure footing to... Um, stand against the schemes of the devil which would come to blow you about, uh, to make you unstable, uh, to make you try to 
get purchase on something which has no stability. Um, temptations that come will um, maybe make it so that you want to depart from what the word says. Maybe make you want to believe something that is just even slightly different to the word. Um, and if the devil can do that, the devil with his temptation um, causes you in so much as it's a reaction within you, it's something that you want to do, to depart from the word, then he puts you on shaky ground. Um, and then once you're on shaky ground, it's a lot easier for him to uh, tempt you further. If you're on the foundation of the word, you have power to stand against his schemes. If he can just kind of knock you off balance a little bit by getting you to believe something that's just not quite what the word says. It might, you know, might be uh, largely what the word says, but it's just something is different about it. Makes me think of near-death experiences. Um, people who have uh, come back to life after uh, nearly dying, they have these uh, near-death experiences and they are, maybe they're convinced about heaven and hell uh, by the near-death experience. But of course, heaven and hell aren't the way that the Bible describes life after death or that Jesus judged them or you know, whatever else, it's not what the word says. Maybe they come back and they they will profess that they're a believer now in Jesus or in the Bible. But actually what's happened is they have been convinced to believe something which is not the word. Believe something that's very slightly different to the word. And you might think, well, they now have faith that the Bible is real, if you like. So that's a good thing. In our simplistic thinking, we might think that, but actually it's a bad thing. Because what they believe to be true is now different to what the Word explains. Um, and someone in such a position can not only uh, convince other people to believe this uh, non-scriptural thing, um, but they themselves are in a position where they can be further uh, deceived easily um, if they were to find out what the word actually says about life after death, then maybe they would be convi convinced in their own minds. No, that's, that's not actually how it is. And so what they've been convinced of is that the Bible is not accurate. In Ephesians 4, so earlier in uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, it says, So this I say and witness in the Master, that you should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having been darkened in their understanding, having been estranged from the life of Elohim because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart who having become callous, have given themselves up to indecency to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Messiah, if indeed you have heard him and were told by him, as truth is in Yeshua, so that you put off with regard to your former way of life, the old man being corrupted according to the desires of the Deceit, okay, so we've got truth um, and deceit mentioned here. And we know, of course, that the devil leads the world astray. 
It says that they've been darkened in their understanding, um, estranged from the life of Elohim because of the ignorance that is in them. And we'll see um, the response that people have uh, to the word and the devil's part in that as we proceed. And to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Okay, so the the devil's lies are reproved by the light. Um, and somebody got in touch recently saying, could you do a teaching on the battle of the battles of the mind? And I said, well, I will cover it when I do uh, the teaching on the devil. Um, but we'll see that what the devil does is he comes and he stands against the word of Elohim. Um, another common thing with the near-death experiences is, is that they feel like there's some kind of being which is guiding them through the process. Um, some misapprehend that to be Jesus, um, but some kind of spiritual uh, entity. And actually, as I say, what the what they're being told is in contradiction to the Bible. So the truth, um, the light, if you like, people um, know what the light is and then something will come up in opposition to the light that will declare it uh, to be wrong. Um, we see when people receive the word, the devil snatches it away from uh, their hearts, um, but they are complicit in this. If we go back to the previous slide, it says here that it is because of the hardness of their heart, they've been darkened in their understanding and estranged from the life of Elohim. But of course, this doesn't come by the agency of God himself. It comes because their hard heart is deceived. The devil comes and snatches those things away from their heart. And as I say, they're complicit in that. They don't want to come to the light. They want to believe the lie instead. You tell someone the truth and it's not something they want to hear. And then you give them an alternative by which they can continue in their delusion. Um, those who want no part of the truth will reject it in favor of uh, the lie. So the battle of the mind is um, all to do with taking into captivity to Messiah um, the thought that you have. If you have a thought that is, um, you know, maybe you'd like to believe the lie in some way or you're you're tempted by whatever the lie is, taking that into captivity to obedience to Messiah, who is the word made flesh. So obedience to the word, it's recognizing those things as a lie and bringing them into captivity to obedience to the word. And it's something that is done within one's own will within one's own mind. It's knowing what the truth is, knowing what the lie is, and choosing the truth. Um, the devil doesn't make you make that choice. He just presents you uh, with the choice. So the battle for the mind is something which is entirely within your own control. It's, there's no kind of outside forces that are affecting it. 
Um, it is simply a decision that you make within yourself. Do you uh, stand on the truth or do you, are you tempted to believe the lie? And that you put on the new man which was created according to Elohim in righteousness and holiness or set apartness of the truth. Therefore, having put off the false, speak truth. So truth, deceit, truth, the false. Uh, each one with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be wrath, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your rage, nor uh, give place to the devil. So you are to put off the false. The devil will come with lies, will come with falsity. You are to put that off uh, and put on Messiah, put on the armor of Elohim, if you like. Um, don't give place to the devil who will come with these things. Acknowledge in your mind that the truth is what is firm. The lies will make you unstable, will make you reel to and fro like a drunkard. Um, have that established in your mind uh, so that when the lie comes, you can defend against it. That's what the the word is for, part of what the word is for, uh, so that we can distinguish the lies of Hasatan. Don't give any place to them. Don't indulge the thoughts when they arise in your mind. Don't start thinking about them and indulging them. Give no place to the devil and his temptations. Rather, stand firm on the word. James 1, 12 to 16, and these pictures, some of them... Uh, some of them have kind of like the, the popular conception of the devil in, um, but as I alluded to at the beginning, it's difficult to get an image of uh, the devil himself because nobody uh, knows what he looks like. These images are uh, to portray a concept, the idea that the devil leads man astray with temptations is uh, illustrated in this picture. Um, not to not to say that this is what the devil is like. Um, the idea of the devil with horns and half goat, half man, and all those things—they're just. Um, misconceptions, the, the ideas of the world which have kind of influenced uh, what people believe about the Bible. But anyway, James says, Blessed is, is the man who does endure trial, for when he has been proved, he shall receive the crown of life which the Master has promised to those who love him. And I don't think that the crown of life is an actual crown that you will be given. It's a figurative language as far as I'm concerned here. You will be adorned with eternal life. Um, verse 13 says, Let no one say when he is enticed, I am enticed by Elohim, for Elohim is not enticed by evil matters, and he entices no one. And as I say, it says in some parts that it's Elohim that does something and then that is explained to actually be by the hand of the devil. So we should never say, I am enticed or I am tempted by the devil uh, because that's not how Elohim works. He didn't send the devil to put temptation in your heart. He sent the devil to give you a choice so that the temptation which is within you um, would be 
triggered, would be activated so that you would uh, feel that temptation which lies within your own heart um, so that you could have that battle against uh, good versus evil uh, so that you could be proven whether or not you believe the truth. Verse 14 says, But each one is enticed when he is drawn away by his own desires and trapped. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it has been accomplished, brings forth death. So, accurately, we would say that we are tempted by the evil that is within us, the uh, lusts of the flesh. And of course, the flesh, uh, if we walk after the flesh, that brings forth death. Uh, you see that in Romans 8, the mind of the flesh is death, um, which is acknowledged by James here as well. Sin, when it has been accomplished, and remember, sin dwells in one's flesh, brings forth death. So the devil will bring forth something, some temptation, and you will either want to walk after the flesh or after the spirit. You will have a choice which one you will follow. The spirit, the word, the truth, all kind of vaguely synonymous with one another. Um, if you choose that, then you have passed the test. You have been proven by Yehovah. The devil may have asked for you to sift you, but you have proven yourself to be the wheat rather than the chaff. Do not go astray, my beloved brothers, or my beloved brothers. So we have a choice. Okay, When the devil comes, just like Yeshua said, I've prayed that you will stand firm in the belief, like Peter says in his letter, stand firm in the belief. That is... Um, that is always an option uh, for you to pass the test. If you fail, you have the uh, opportunity to repent, uh, as we see with Peter, as we saw with Job. So if you give in to the temptation, you have the opportunity to repent. But you have uh, the choice of not needing to repent in the first place. The repentance is um, always comes after some element of uh, discomfort for the person. The way that you would want to proceed is to pass the test. If you fail the test, it'll have negative consequences in your life, um, but you do have the option to repent afterwards. Uh, the difficulty that people fall into is thinking, oh, I'm, I will repent at some, some point in the future. But we see in how Yehovah deals with Pharaoh that he may well harden you in your sin. You might think in your mind that you've come up with a loophole, I'll give in to the temptation and then I will uh, repent in the future. But if it is in your heart to uh, give in to the temptation in the first place, Yehovah may well harden you in your stubbornness. Um, he may well make it so that you are blind to um, your need for repentance in the future. Even if you think, I'll be fine, I'll be able to know that I need to repent, you're not going to outsmart Yahuwah. So 
James's advice, do not go astray. Recognize the way that the uh, temptations come and that they're not temptations that come from without, that make you feel tempted. The temptation um, comes from within. The thing itself is just an objective thing. Whether you are tempted by it is entirely subjective. So recognize the way that these things work. Recognize that it is just a lie that the devil is telling you. And stand firm. Do not go astray, my beloved brothers. 1 Corinthians 7, 4-5 says, The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the, hus the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. I've known people to, uh, to misunderstand this, uh, to mean that if the husband wants to have sex, the wife must have sex. The wife wants to have sex. The husband must have sex in that moment. But that's not what it's saying. It goes on and says, Do not deprive one another except with agreement for a time. Do not deprive one another. Okay, so it's not talking about on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. It's talking about depriving one another not having sex at all, um, rather than in that moment, the, the wife has no authority to deny the husband. It's just saying, don't let that then be the way that you live your life. Don't deprive one another of sex, full stop. It says, uh, to give yourself to fasting and prayer. So if you've agreed that you're going to fast from uh, from sex, then that's obviously reasonable. Come together again so that Satan does not try you because of your lack of self-control. So this uh, implies to me to be saying that there are ways in which you can put yourself in a situation where you will be prone to uh, the temptation which comes from within you. Uh, so you can put yourself in situations where you will be more likely to be tempted or you can be cognizant of those things and uh, kind of preempt them in the way that you live your life, which obviously makes sense uh, from experience. I think we can all um, acknowledge that there are situations in which you will feel temptation and situations that you can make so that you avoid that temptation. So you pray that Yahuwah doesn't lead you into temptation, but don't lead yourself into temptation either. In Acts 5, 1 to 4, it says, But a certain man named Hananiah with uh, Shapira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back from the price, his wife also being aware of it, and uh, brought a certain part and laid it at the feet of the apostles. But Peter said, Hananiah, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the set-apart spirit and keep back from the price um, of the land for yourself. While it remained, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own authority? Why have you conceived this deed in your heart? So again, this idea of um, being complicit in it, it's described as Satan operating in the heart. Why has Satan filled your heart? And then it's phrased as, why have you conceived this deed in your heart? So Satan comes with the proposition, which 
might well tempt you, um, but the temptation comes from within. So Satan fills the heart to do it by giving the temptation, and then it is uh, within each person to do the thing that in has been proposed. So Satan is involved, but it is within each one of us. And this is the parable, the seed that is the word of Elohim. And those by the wayside are the ones uh, who hear, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts. So the devil doesn't control you. Um, he will simply tempt you, perhaps with lies. When it came to uh, the, the last passage in Acts 5, Peter says, why has the devil filled your heart? Because it's the responsibility of the one whose heart is filled, whether or not they believe the lies of the devil. The responsibility ultimately lies with them. The devil has a part in it. He will come and tell lies to lead you astray, um, but it is down to you whether or not uh, you believe the lie. Um, here, the, the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, but similarly, he is not in control of the person's heart. The way that he can take the word away from your heart is again by lies, but you have to be complicit in that. You have to prefer the lie over the truth of what the word says. In 1 Corinthians 10, 11 to 13, it says, all these came upon them as examples and they were written as a warning to us on whom the end of the ages have come. So that he who thinks he stands, let him take heed lest he fall. No trial is overtaken you except such as is common to man. Elohim is trust, trustworthy and shall not allow you to be tried beyond what you are able, but with the trial uh, shall also make the way of escape, enabling you uh, to bear it. So we are tempted by Hasatan and all of the things that happen in the scriptures are things which are examples for us to know uh, how the devil operates. Um, Paul writes to the Corinthians that the end of the uh, ages has come upon them and upon him. Uh, so the, the last days in Scripture are from Yeshua forward. That's what Elohim uh, counts as the last days. Um, but Paul tells us here that these trials which come, that the devil presents us with a proposition, um, we can either believe it or not believe it based on what is inside of us. These things have come as an example so that we know that those trials are common to everyone. All the people that we can see who uh, give way to temptation in Scripture are warnings to us. And all of the people we can see who stood firm against the temptation to do evil uh, are also examples to us. But we can learn from this that the idea of it was too hard, I couldn't do it, is another example of a lie. Uh, God 
tells the truth. He says, look, you are able to bear these things and we can either believe that or we can believe the lie that when God says that it's not true, and we are unable to bear the trial, he will make a way of escape. It might not seem appealing to you in the moment, but there is a way by which you can overcome the uh, temptation. So when you have temptation, as you will, know that you don't have to give in to it, no matter how strong it is. And no matter how strong it is, you can, um, you can turn from it. You can resist the devil and his lies, and he will flee from you. So no matter how strong the tem temptation seems in the moment, if you resist it, it will depart from you. It's not something that has to overcome you. John 8, 44 says, You are of your father, the devil, Yeshua, speaking, speaking to the Jews who believed in him. And desires and the the desires of your father you wish to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and has not stood in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks the the lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So the in the lie if the truth is that which is steadfast and that which is stable, the lie is something which is ever-shifting, has no uh, consistency, has no stability. Uh, in the devil, there is no truth in him. There is no stability in him. Um, so you either believe the truth or you believe the lies. And if you go after the lies because they inspire something within you and you kind of, you want them to be true, uh, then you can know that there is no stability in that path and that you have no foundation. If you want to go after those things, fair enough. That's what's within your heart. Um, but if you want something secure for the future to actually bear fruit then you believe the truth he is the father of lies he is the one from whom the lies come um, and you can either be of your father the devil um, and included in that in first john are those who do not love their brothers, those who do not show chesed, those who are not Yehovah's chesed, as we saw in uh, the, the weightier matters teaching. Speaking of being a child of the devil, we get some uh, detail about what that uh, constitutes in First John 3. The one doing sin is of the devil because the devil sinned from the beginning. You are of your father, the devil. For this purpose, the son of Elohim was manifested to destroy the works of the devil, the works that are pursuant to the lies that the devil tells. Everyone having been born of Elohim does not sin because his seed stays in him. He is powerless to sin because he has been born of Elohim. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Everyone not doing righteousness is not of Elohim, neither the one not loving his brother. So those in whom chesed, and emet are not uh, present. That is a child of the devil. That is um, being a child of the father of lies. 
If you are a child of the father of lies, then you are um, a child of lies, if you like. Um, one who does the works of the devil, one who believes the lies. Uh, contrary to that is the one who is the child of Elohim, the one who does not sin because his seed, the word of God, remains in him and he is powerless to sin. Not that he can't be tempted into doing sin, but he does not make a practice of sinning. Um, someone who repents, someone who acknowledges that the the sin was worthless and allows it to fall away from them rather than it becoming something that they are embroiled uh, in. It's the difference between a child of God and a child of the father of lies, one who stands on what is firm as opposed to one who um, puts their trust in that which has no uh, stability. In First John uh, chapter 4, so the next chapter, it says, You are of Elohim, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of Elohim. The one knowing Elohim hears us. He who is not of Elohim does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of the truth and the spirit of the delusion. So, again, it's the truth versus the lie. These are consistently juxtaposed in Scripture. When you understand what the truth is, that it's reliable, that it's steady, um, it's that which has stability, that which is faithful, is trustworthy, as opposed to the lie, then these things uh, come to life, uh, come to life rather, so to speak. So we understand the concept of having a Messiah in us, having Christ in us. We kind of understand that idea, having his spirit within us. He who is in the world is a similar concept to that. Um, so he who is in you, Yehovah, is greater than he who is in the world. So the world has uh, Hasatan in them. They believe his lies. They believe uh, what he says against the word of Elohim. Um, when the truth is spoken, it, it accords with those who are of God. The same is true with the lie, um, with those who are uh, children of the father of lies. When the lie is spoken, that accords with them. And they believe that that is true because they relate uh, to it, if you like. When they hear it, it rings true to them. Whereas Yeshua said, my sheep know my voice. The same is true with the devil. When the devil speaks a lie, his sheep, if you like, the, uh, the congregation of Hasatan, hear his voice and, uh, and inherently believe the lie. In 2 Corinthians 11, 2-4, it says, I am jealous for you with a jealousy according to Elohim. For I gave you in marriage to one husband to present you as a, an innocent virgin to Messiah. 
But I'm afraid lest as the serpent deceived uh, Chava, or Eve, by his trickery, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Messiah. For indeed, if he who is coming proclaims another Yeshua whom we have not proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different good news or gospel which you have not accepted, you put up with it well enough. Okay, so this is another uh, form of when the lie is spoken, those who are of the lie, those who have uh, he who is in the world in them, they believe this um, this false idea, they believe the lie that they are presented with because it accords with them. Um, Paul expresses here that he is afraid lest they would be corrupted by the same lie uh, or the same lies that Eve was corrupted by when uh, Hasatan came to Eve in the garden and she believed the lie. She saw that the fruit was uh, desirable uh, to make one wise. And she went after that. Um, Paul is saying, I'm afraid lest you are also led astray by similar uh, lies. And this brings us to something which is very important for us to acknowledge. There are those who will come and they will preach the truth. They will tell you what the word actually says. And there are those who come with kind of a mirage, a fake version of the word that may well be tempting, that may well be seductive. Um, they kind of make the word about something else. You know, it's all about love, it's all about this or that, and they give their idea of what the word should be about. And we have um, quite strong warnings in Scripture about uh, such people who come with another gospel. Um, in Second Corinthians 11, okay, so this was... Uh, Earlier in Second Corinthians 11, later it says, Such are f false apostles, deceptive workers, masquerading as apostles of Messiah. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as a messenger or an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. So the enemy has agents who will come and will give you another gospel to believe. They'll tell you about another spirit that is different to what is written in the Bible. Um, and they will try to deceive you, but they're not agents of truth, of things which are steady, steadfast, reliable. They are agents of the lie. They are deceptive um, agents. And they may well come and try to deceive you with the truth, like the devil did with Yeshua, when he said, it is written this. But Yeshua said, it's also written this. So people may well come to you and they may well look like they are uh, agents of righteousness. They may well come speaking the word of Elohim, but it will lead you astray. They're not giving you the full story and they will lead you into a false gospel or they'll lead you into a false understanding of... Um, of the word and of who Yehovah is, uh, as is explained 
by the word. In Romans 16, 17 to 18, it says, Now I call upon you, brothers, watch out for those who cause divisions and stumbling, contrary to the teaching which you learned. Turn away from them. For such ones do not serve our master Yeshua Messiah, but their own stomach. By smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the innocent. But it's in the same way that the devil snatches the word out of the heart of people. People have to be complicit in it. When presented with the truth and presented with the lie, they choose the lie. These people may well come with a deception which allows someone to believe that uh, they don't have to do what the word says to do, but it is down to the person whether or not they will be deceived by it. Uh, false teachers can't deceive you in and of themselves. You have to be complicit in the procedure. But be warned, because we're forewarned by Scripture of these actors that they exist out there and be diligent not to listen to uh, things that appeal to the flesh rather than the spirit, kind of nonsense teachings that say that they're teachings about the Bible because they talk about the Bible, um, but don't actually address what the Bible truly teaches you about being unrighteous and the way that you can repent and be righteous and turn back uh, to Elohim. Don't be confused by these fluffy nothing teachers. That's why we're warned about these people uh, in Scripture so that we can be diligent uh, to not be deceived by them. Yeah, willing, I'll see you next week.